Tay. Elijah Tay is a passionate youth activist who has been involved in advocacy work since they were in secondary school. At the age of 16, they founded initiatives like Queers of LH and My Queer Story SG to uplift the voices of the LGBTQ plus community in school and in Singapore respectively. They have also shared extensively in live discussions and podcasts, such as on New Narrative's pol political agenda, Sayoni's webinars, Spectrum podcast, Lesby Heard's Instagram Live, and Frene Health's online workshop. They believe in the importance of creating safe spaces while moving society towards becoming a safe space for all. Tonight, Elijah Tay will be speaking on the topic, it's not a culture war, it's a proxy war. By definition, a proxy war is a war instigated by a major power, which does not itself become involved. Growing up in a sheltered environment, they used to be ignorant and closed-minded, but acknowledging their queerness helped them to open their eyes, mind, and heart. Their introspection enabled their extrospection. Through this ongoing journey, they have come to learn of how the personal is political and the lack of substantive action from the top is harming the lives of fellow LGBTQ plus folks. In this presentation, Elijah shares about everything and surrounding their queerness, coming out, facing discrimination, getting involved in advocacy, activism, and politics, and simply being and becoming. I will now have Elijah describe themselves for our visually impaired viewers. Hi, so uh, I have cropped hair, it's black, and it looks like I have blonde highlights as well because I just cut my hair. Then um, I'm wearing a navy blue t-shirt and I have a necklace underneath. Oh, and I'm of Chinese descent, yeah. Thank you, and yes, now we can have our second presentation. All right, thank you. So, hey everyone, thank you for being here today. I'm Elijah and I use they them pronouns. This is a simple introduction, but it has been a lifelong journey of unlearning that has brought me from being an ignorant person to being confidently, proudly, and unapologetically queer today. Before I begin, here's a trigger warning that there will be mentions of LGBTQ plus discrimination, including biphobia, transphobia, and homophobia. So I grew up in a relatively comfortable and sheltered environment, especially as a Chinese person from a middle income household in Singapore. Issues pertaining to social justice were never brought up at home or school. And my privilege allowed me to be indifferent towards the inequalities that I didn't even know exist. In lower primary, my family and I used to watch Crime Watch together on Channel 5. In one of the episodes, a transgender sex worker was portrayed criminally. In response to this, my parents expressed how disgusted they were towards her, the transgender community, and gender-affirming surgery. I didn't have a mind of my own and never questioned these ideas that were fed to me. I simply took in what I heard. Of my 12 years of education in MOE schools, it was almost a daily affair to hear words like gay being thrown around as insults or to ridicule someone. In upper primary, I was a huge fan of this K-pop artist called G-Dragon. His fashion sense <laughs> spans broadly, and sometimes that means presenting in an effeminate manner. With how stereotypes associate femininity in men with being gay, this welcome comments from my classmates who will comment that, oh, G-Dragon is gay and that kind of stuff. So whenever I heard this, I remember feeling very offended <laughs> because of how much negative connotation was tied to the word gay. When I was in secondary two, there was a senior that I helped, held a deep sense of admiration for, but I never questioned it to be anything beyond platonic. It never even crossed my mind that I could be attracted to any gender other than the opposite gender. I was constantly texting her and talking about her, and I did not even realize it, but my friend did. You know, you might be bi. My friend said to me one day, I had never heard of that term before, and for the next couple of weeks, I spent time on the internet looking more into this, and that was the first time I heard about the term LGBT, and that, and that experiencing love outside this heteronormative narrative was possible, was a legitimate thing. 
So through watching YouTube videos and scrolling Instagram, I learned more about the lived experiences of LGBTQ plus persons, such as their coming out stories, stories of discrimination, or them simply talking about their sexuality and or gender identity. The experiences resonated with me and I quickly realized that I am bisexual and also that the feelings I had for my senior were definitely not platonic. On one hand, I was excited about having just discovered a new aspect about my identity, being able to put a label on the feelings I have felt towards others over the years. On the other hand, I did feel a tinge of fear when I started thinking of coming out. How would people react? Would I be kicked out of my house? Were my friends going to leave me? When I finally came out to my parents, my attraction to girls was dismissed as a phase. I was told that, oh, since I was bi, I was 50% gay, 50% straight. <laughs> and so I could try to become 70% straight. Eventually, I would become 100% straight again. They also said that they were disappointed in me and told me not to come out to anyone, especially since they would not know how to answer to our relatives. Home used to be a comfortable and safe space for me. But after those nights of conversations, home became a house one that I could not feel warm and safe and loved in. It did not help that school was neither a safe nor inclusive space either. Although I did not come out per se, because of the LGBT affirming content I shared on my Instagram page, I received homophobic troll messages from my batchmates. And knowing that they came from the more popular kids in school, I started feeling like I was constantly being judged, being gossiped about, being outcasted. I started socially withdrawing from my schoolmates and it became difficult for me to find a support system on campus. Furthermore, the discrimination I faced came not only from my schoolmates, but also from the teachers and school leaders, the adults in the school who were supposed to help make school a safe and conducive learning environment for everyone. I've had short hair since I was secondary two after I shaved my head for hair for hope. In secondary three, I tried to run for CCA president, but during the interview, the teacher commented that the CCA president would be the face representing the CCA and that my hair was not appropriate. So true enough, I was not assigned the CCA president despite the support from my CCA mates. I felt like I was being gender policed and because I did not conform to the gender norms of gender expression, I was denied a leadership opportunity in school. There was also an incident in a lecture theatre when I was in secondary four. So about three quarters of the cohort was present and I was sitting at the back half of the theatre, a good distance away from the lecturer who was at the front. So before the lecture started, she looked at me and speaking through the microphone, she told me to sit properly, then went on to comment something along the lines of, as long as you're wearing a skirt, I will, I will perceive you as a girl. If you want to be a boy, wait for your next life. I was taken aback and did not know how to respond to a statement. I simply continued to sit there in silence as I waited for the actual lecture to commence. I think what made things worse was that she was a teacher that I respected a lot prior to her making that transphobic statement. And for her to be capable of saying something like that destroyed any bit of trust I had left for the school staff and the institution itself. I did not know who I could report such incidents to or if reporting it was even a safe option for me, when a teacher I trusted was the one who hurt me. Last year was my final out of six years in the school, and before I graduated, I felt that it was important for me to finally raise this issue up to the school leaders before I left. During a meeting with the vice principal, I broke down and started bawling as I recounted the incidents to him. Even I was so surprised that I was so deeply hurt by these instances of discrimination. But even so, he simply said, that is not discrimination. You shouldn't feel too hurt. I remember being visibly baffled after hearing what he said, but he simply stood his ground and trivialized the incidents. I then asked if there was anything he or the school could do, especially since the lecturer was still a prominent staff member in the school. But he just said that since it has been two years since the incident, she would probably have forgotten about it and there would not have been a point in having a conversation with her about it. So yet again, I felt like the authorities in the school could not be trusted to protect or look out for me. And this meeting fueled the hurt I experienced from and within this institution. 
The recurrence of such discrimination made me realize that discrimination is an issue that spans beyond the student body. The larger issue lies in those in positions of power. How can we make the school curriculum, such as that for sexuality education, more inclusive? How can we ensure that teachers are well equipped to respond to bullying and gender-based violence in schools? When are we going to start implementing mandatory sensitivity training for all staff members so that they are not the ones perpetuating discrimination against their own students? What are the policies in place and resources available to ensure that LGBTQ plus students are protected and supported in schools? I don't have green hair anymore, but some of you may recognize me from the Fix Schools Not Students movement in January this year. For me and many of us, Ashley's case was the last straw and we had to do something to call for an urgent shift in policies to protect and support transgender students in schools. I have been advocating for LGBTQ plus rights since I first realized that the community has been facing discrimination. Being aware of the inequalities that plague our world and society, I could not simply be a passive bystander. It was second nature to me to speak up about the things I care about, to fight for the rights of those who have been denied them. As I've shared earlier, before I came out to myself, I read up a lot about the LGBTQ plus community and the people within it through online platforms like YouTube and Instagram. However, I also realized that a lot of this content was based in Western countries and there was barely any Asian and or Singaporean based content that I could access, at least not easily. So recognizing that there was a severe lack of LGBT affirming resources, especially for youths, when I was in secondary four, I started Queers of LH, an Instagram page that shared LGBT affirming content and resources, creating a safe space for fellow LGBTQ plus people in my school. And through the page, I was able to extend my support for schoolmates who reached out anonymously or otherwise. In the same year, I attended the Ready for Repeal town hall discussion, during which one of the speakers made a reference to how then Minister of Education, Ong Yi Kung, made a statement that the LGBTQ plus community in Singapore faced no discrimination at work, housing and education. The speaker then spoke about how it was hence important for more LGBTQ plus people to share about our experiences of discrimination so that others will be aware that this is a legitimate problem. Following up to this, one of the members of the audience raised the question of how it would be unsafe for some people, such as civil servants and those who are financially, financially dependent on their family members to share their stories without risking their job security and a roof over their head, for instance. So I thought about this on my way home and decided to start my Queer Story SG, an online platform on Instagram and Facebook that amplifies the voices of LGBTQ plus individuals in Singapore so that others can empathize with their stories of discrimination. Story submitters also have the option of anonymity so as to protect their identities while being able to get their stories out. Also following up from the Ready for Appeal Town Hall, I led a team of volunteers in my constituency to converse with our members of parliament about our concerns with regards to Section 377A, an archaic colonial law in Singapore that criminalizes gay sex. Speaking to these MPs helped me to realize how significant a role these individuals in such positions of power had in determining the direction of our nation's policies and legislation, as their decision not to raise these concerns up to Parliament meant that the level of LGBTQ plus acceptance and inclusion in Singapore will remain at the status quo, which it has. Last year, we had our general elections in Singapore. Since it was held amidst the pandemic, most of the conversations, resources and rallies surrounding the elections moved to the virtual space. Contesting in my GRC was a new party called Red Dot United. Their manifesto, Green Charter, appealed to me in terms of their push for more inclusive policies such as lowering the voting age, lowering the age for singles to purchase a built-to-order flat and their care for environmental sustainability. Although I am not eligible to vote yet, I still felt that it was important and an eye-opener for me to get involved in our nation's politics firsthand. So I volunteered for the party, helping them to do some research, and I was also one of the counting agents. Aside from this party, there were also many other voices speaking up about pressing issues in our nation's politics, calling for changes and asking election candidates to address these concerns. All these discussions helped me to have a clearer picture of the intrinsic link between social justice and politics. Ultimately, it is the rules set and maintained 
and actions taken or lack like thereof by the people in power, by our government, that determines the state of our nation on the ground, that establishes the level of equity, inclusion and harmony, or rather lack like thereof, in our society. I learned that the personal is political and that the political is personal. How do we play an active role as citizens and our people on this land to ensure that, that everyone is equal and respected, that no one is left behind? How do we hold our leaders, ourselves, corporations, organizations, and those in privileged positions accountable so that we will be able to recite our pledge in truth to build a democratic society based on justice and equality? As such, through my involvement in activism and politics and recognizing how our current government lacks sufficient dissenting voices to contest the oppressive status quo, I aspire to one day have a voice in our parliament to be able to raise the concerns of the disenfranchised, to, at a more impactful level, push for substantive policies that will eradicate inequality as far as possible. Contrary to Minister Lawrence Wong's belief, we are not importing culture walls. In fact, it is the government's apathy towards social issues that has led to the plague of ignorance, ignorance that fuels discriminatory acts. This is a proxy war amongst our people, instigated by those in power, and they need to hold themselves accountable to all their people to fulfill their promise of democracy, justice, and equality. Thank you. Thank you so much for that sharing, Elijah. Um, and thank you for doing so much for the LGBTQ plus community. Your passion and achievements at such a young age is extremely inspiring and impressive. Um, so now the floor is open for questions. I have a anonymous question. Did you face people telling you you're too young to know anything or to understand, etc.? How do you deal with them? I'm a little older than you, but I've heard it many times. It's difficult and annoying to hear. Yeah, I relate to that. I mean, like, even when I came out to my parents when I was 14 or so, they were like, oh, yeah, it's a face. You're too young to know anything. And I guess that plays into, like, discrimination in terms of age or so, like, ageism. Like, people think that just because we're young, we don't know anything. But I think with how much accessibility there is to information, at least, like, more in the as compared to in the past with the internet and everything, and also like more spaces for discussion, although still restricted. Um, it is unfair to say that like younger people don't know anything. And I guess how I respond to it, um, yeah, I guess like how I would respond to it would be like how, whatever I just said earlier, like I do read up about things. I don't just like repost everything I see without doing my own research or reading up or hearing from various perspectives and hearing about people's actual lived experiences, right? So I guess it's just doing that. And I don't live to, how to say, like, I don't live to like prove myself to anyone. So if you think I'm ignorant, then okay, that's kind of your problem, it isn't mine. So I'm just gonna keep being me and I'm just gonna keep like standing up for what I believe in. If you're just gonna like turn a blind eye to what I'm saying or just ignore everything I say just because I'm younger than you, then that's kind of on you. You know, like I'm providing information for free and you're not taking it. So <laughs> that's kind of on you. Yeah. <laughs> we have another question. Would you share your experience, if any, over job discrimination? Hmm. So in terms of applying for jobs, there hasn't been much of a problem because uh, I have um, like I've applied for like part-time jobs like through friends so like there's like that connection there so um, there hasn't been much like oh I won't hire you like they will usually like give face to my friend and hire me that kind of things but within like the workplace itself I have experienced discrimination in terms of being misgendered so um, right now like we have like it's mostly um, work from home so although like on my Zoom name, I do put my pronouns like they, them, there, um, sometimes people would still like misgender me and refer to me by like she, her, despite us having worked together for a really long time. So I guess that's like, um, that's the main thing that's been bothering me in terms of like discrimination at work. 
And yeah, it just gets really exhausting like hearing them apologize all the time without actually changing the way they refer to me. So yeah, that's 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 as far as workplace discrimination I've um, experienced. Yeah. And we have another question. Do you think there is something distinctly different from how the Western world talks about queerness versus how it is talked about in Singapore? Hmm. I guess like the first thing that came to mind is the concept of coming out. Because I think in the in our context in like Asia or in Singapore, it's I, I've heard about this from somewhere else. I don't remember who, but like in our context, it's much more letting people in rather than coming out because there are a lot of factors in place that makes it unsafe for us to just like have the privilege to like be on Instagram or like be on social media and put up a post like, hey, I'm gay or I'm queer, I'm non-binary and that kind of stuff. So um, it's a lot of letting people in like slowly coming out to like maybe like girlfriend, um, like one day if you're like chilling at a rooftop and like talking like heart to heart stuff and then like you tell them, hey, there's something I need to tell you. That kind of stuff like it's, in our Asian context, it's a lot of like letting people in rather than like just um, sharing as openly as some people in Western countries can do it as well. So that was the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? If, if there is. Okay, Martha, Dr. Martha has a question. Okay, I'll just unmute myself. So I know you were one of the people who protested at MOE and then you were arrested. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so if you don't mind, uh, sorry for my ignorance. Uh, so were you in jail? Was it scary? <laughs> Will you do it again? And, <laughs> and uh, like, you know, I think one of the reasons why people don't do more activism in Singapore is because they are scared of going to jail. So now that you've done it, you know, would you advocate for it? <laughs> <laughs> um. For legal reasons, I cannot say that I advocate for it, but like do what sits right with you. And if you feel like a certain law is not, like laws, legality and morality are different things. So like if you think a law is not moral, then like stand up against it. So I don't regret what I did. I think it's important that like, I mean, the whole point to wanting systemic change in the first place is shaking up the status quo, right? And protesting in itself is also an act of shaking up the status quo and demanding that, like, my, like, acting out my constitutional right to freedom of speech and also contesting a law that makes no sense. <laughs> it, like, it just suppresses, like, the people's voices, right? So, yeah, I don't regret what I did. Um, and... Um, yeah, so if you want to do it, um, don't say that I encourage you to, <laughs> but <laughs> go for it. Um, I wasn't in jail, I was just like brought to lock up. So um, basically like a brief run through of the whole process is they arrested us, we were brought into the police vehicle, the police vehicle brought us to the police station. Um, we were there for about four to five hours, half the time was just a really long time of waiting very painful amount of time of waiting because we had nothing. I couldn't scroll TikTok and I was just <laughs> staring blankly for two hours. <laughs> and the other half of the time was um, the interrogation. So we were brought to separate interrogation rooms to speak to our respective officers, our respective investigating officers to just answer their questions and everything. And then we had to have someone come down to bail us out. So yeah, I wasn't in jail, but we were in a lockup area. So during like a period of time during the waiting area, I was in a lockup cell. So I was cuffed to like the like a corner of the lockup room. And one of the other protesters were locked up at the other corner of the same room. And it was a pretty small room. So we thought we could like converse to like kill time, but it was very echoey, the space. So like we couldn't hear each other even when we spoke. So we were just, you know what, we're just going to chill here and wait until we get to get out. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, that's a very like TLDR version of like what went down like post-arrest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions for now, uh, we will move on to our third speaker. If you think of any other questions for Elijah, you can type it in the private chat and Elijah can answer you there. <laughs> 